So, good morning, everyone. Uh, and uh, I would like to start uh, by thanking the organizers for um, uh, giving me the opportunity to come here this morning and speak a little bit about how we work with uh, uh, a quality registry for atopic dermatitis in, in Sweden. Uh, and my talk is uh, entitled uh, SWEDAD, uh, a nationwide Swedish registry for patients with atopic dermatitis receiving systemic pharmacotherapy. And um, these are just my disclosures of interest. So um, the story of uh, SWEDAD began in 2018. Dupilumab, uh, a new biologic agent uh, for uh, treatment of uh, topic dermatitis, gave us um, new possibilities to treat those patients who had severe disease in a uh, more efficient way. So that was coming, and there was also a promise of more drugs um, to come in uh, the future, um, in the coming years. So. Um, we uh, met our university clinic uh, representatives to discuss the future of AD management in Sweden. And we uh, quickly decided that we needed a national quality registry to monitor and evaluate these new treatments. Um, and we had an excellent base, and this is a picture of um, um, one of our first meetings in, in, in the spring of 2018. Uh, we had an excellent base, and that was the research registry that was already formed at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. Uh, and this was a research registry that was constructed in a way that it proved really useful in the clinical practice as well. So we had an excellent starting point, and that's why we could uh, form and uh, start the registry quite quickly, as I will show you. So we uh, have a steering group for the registry, and we have the uh, university dermatology clinics representatives. We have patient representative from the patient organization for pe people with atopic dermatitis in Sweden. And we also have uh, uh, representatives from private dermatology. And this uh, cartoon, I unfortunately only have it in Swedish, but uh, it's meant to show you the different kinds of uh, treatments that we have for atopic dermatitis uh, based on severity of disease. Uh, so we have these different steps. Um, and the patients that we deal with in the registry are the ones that you see in the upper step here, the uh, systemic treatment for the patients with the most severe disease. Um, so this slide really summarizes the, the, the way that we treat um, uh, atopic dermatitis in Sweden with the emollients and the topical corticosteroids for the patients with mild disease. And uh, then you can add on further treatment as needed. And this is the same, I would say, in Europe and the rest of the world. Uh, but we do have different accessibility to the treatments worldwide, unfortunately. So our aim for the registry was to um, have a tool that should be uh, useful for follow-up and documentation and assessment of the therapies. Uh, and we wanted to use it for the older conventional therapies and the new uh, systemic treatments as well. Uh, we wanted the registry to facilitate patient education and engagement, promote a quality of care, and be user-friendly, and a clinical tool for um, research as well. So uh, just briefly show you the organization, and then I will show you some actual examples from the registry. So we have a, a, a steering group of uh, 20 members, and we are led by uh, two registry managers, uh, Professor Maria Bradley and Associate Professor Emma Johansson. And they reside in, in Stockholm, where the, the um, registry has its administrative base. And they have a smaller work group, uh, uh, and this work group deals with the everyday practicalities of running a successful registry. 
And then we have the larger steering group of which I'm a, a member. Uh, we meet uh, twice each semester to discuss the various issues and um, um, the development of uh, new um, um, functions in the registry and such. And we have a technical platform that is provided by a software company who specializes in uh, producing these kinds of products. So today, um, we started the registry on September 1st, 2019. So uh, one and a half years after the first uh, meeting. And uh, today we have 55 enrolled clinics. We have uh, about uh, 1,850 patients. And these patients have collectively experienced uh, 2,000 treatment periods. And dupilumab is the most prevalent treatment in the registry, followed by methotrexate. And so far, there have been five scientific publications based on data from the registry. And there are uh, several more uh, to come. And the, the registry is also, I might add, still growing. So we have a linear growth in, in the number of patients and the treatment episodes. The registry is accessed for patients and for the healthcare providers who use it through our uh, homepage, uh, swedad.nu. Uh, it looks like this. And the data that we collect, well, we have base data that we collect only once. And you see the examples here. We have the atopic comorbidities for the patients and their first degree relatives. Uh, we register if they actually fulfill the criteria for atopic dermatitis, which of course is important when we do research based on the registry data. Level of education, Fitzpatrick skin type, and I've written here that we also register or are going to register country of birth for patients and their biological parents to be added, I'm writing here, and actually it uh, became functional just this, this past week, so we're starting from now. And we use validated investigator and patient uh, reported outcome measures at uh, every visit. So uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the eczema area and severity index, or EC, that the healthcare provider um, uh, makes that assessment at each visit. And then there are a number of patient reported outcome measures, uh, questionnaires and rating scales uh, for how the uh, eczema impacts your everyday life. So we have the, the POEM questionnaire, we have DLQI, uh, which is Dermatology Life Quality Index. We have a rating scale for itch, and we also use a depression uh, rating scale that was mentioned in earlier talks this morning. And these are used according to the recommendations by HOME, uh, which is a global initiative for harmonizing the outcome uh, uh, measurements for eczema. And these are outcome measures that uh, you should use when you do clinical studies and also in registries. We um, register body weight, we register blood pressure, we have uh, a, a sample of other questions that we ask the patients um, at each visit, and we also once a year uh, register data on alcohol and smoking habits, as well as uh, selected other comorbidities. And this is, these cartoons show how the patients uh, look and feel before treatment. Uh, afterwards, it's another thing, hopefully. Uh, so the data collection strategy is digital. So the patients, they access the registry through uh, the electronic device of their choice, smartphone or reading tablet or, or computer. And they can log on to the registry at any time prior to the visit and they use uh, electronic identification, bank ID, uh, and bank ID is uh, over 99% of all Swedish citizens uh, between the ages of 18 and 65 are um, using bank ID, and 
outside of that age range. Most people are using it there as well. So it, it works really well. Self-reporting is a fundamental um, for the um, data collection strategy. Um, we aim for the patients to report most of the data themselves. And this uh, requires us to carefully edit the things that we actually used to, um, should choose to um, include in the registry. And uh, we have to consider the time consumption for the patient. It has to be quick and easy. And there are no mandatory data fields. So uh, you don't get the um, error message or the, the red text saying that you need to fill this out and this out. Uh, so you can register as little or as much as you want. And we think that this has promoted uh, coverage rate. It's easy to join the registry for both healthcare providers and the patients. Um, the drawback might be that you could have um, um, a data density that is um, less than you uh, would desire. Um, you can oftentimes compensate for this afterwards. Data that you are missing, you can uh, add afterwards if needed. So let me just show you a few examples of the interface that we as healthcare providers can access and show and discuss with our patients. So this is a um, male patient born in 1990. And you can see uh, in this, um, on this slide here that uh, initially this patient had the uh, treatment with methotrexate. And you can also see that the EC score was quite high prior to treatment and um, considerably lower, almost zero, uh, a while after he started methotrexate. And um, you can also see that something happened. So metotrexate stopped and we have the purple bar instead with this, which is dupilumab. And uh, at a quick glance, you can see here that the reason uh, why he stopped methotrexate was due to nausea uh, that you can read uh, down here. Uh, so at a quick glance, even if you don't know this patient, you get a lot of information. Uh, and we can choose to plot other things uh, in this graph as well. So here we have the, the poem and the uh, rating of itch. And we can see that the patient responds well to um, dupilumab. And here we have the depression rating scale and the DLQI as well. So uh, without really knowing much about this patient, if you log on to the registry prior to meeting him, you get a lot of information. And this is something that we also show uh, our patients and we discuss it with them at, at every visit. Uh, and this is another one of my patients, uh, a woman born in 1976. And uh, as you can see, uh, she has had a, um, it, it hasn't been as straightforward for her. She has had multiple different treatments, uh, methotrexate to start with, uh, had to stop due to side effects, tried dupilumab, for a short period of time. Uh, you can read down here that he, she had severe um, eye complications due to the dupilumab, so she opted to uh, discontinue the treatment, uh, strongly encouraged by me. Uh, however, the eczema was much, much better, so she, she still wanted to try it once again, just to make sure, and she did. And unfortunately, the same problems with her eyes. Uh, and then we had a, a, a brief period without any systemic treatment. And now we have uh, been trying uh, a JAK inhibitor and uh, not working too well either, unfortunately, as you can see. Um, and again, if you haven't met her before, you log on to the registry, your first meeting, you can see this, um, the, the history of the patient quite easily. So user friendliness is the key word for the registry. Uh, the patients put in most of the data themselves through their electronic device. We put in the EC score, the body weight, and the blood pressure at each visit. And then we import the, the, the data that the patient uh, filled out on their electronic device. And we do this just prior to meeting them. And uh, we show them the interface and we, we discuss uh, the results. 
and we, we feel that this promotes patient engagement. They understand their treatment, they can see what's happening. And also, um, my feeling is that we as healthcare providers, we tend to forget the, the history, and also the patients sometimes forget uh, what was it like when I had methotrexate. Um, so, just to conclude, when we aim for being a nationwide registry, the coverage rate is of course interesting to know something about. And the coverage rate is determined by a number of different factors, healthcare organization and financing, the accessibility to dermatologists, the marketing of the registry, engagement uh, among the healthcare providers who are to use the registry, and it has to be user-friendly, it has to do what it sets out to do for you. And the illustration here is the uh, number of patients in Swedad per 100,000 inhabitants, inhabitants in uh, different regions of Sweden. And this was back in uh, November of 2022. And you can see that there are uh, quite uh, big differences. And it's really difficult to estimate the coverage rate because we don't have a good marker. But up until 2021, dupilumab was only prescribed for atopic dermatitis by dermatologists. And we had data on that, and we could compare that to the number of patients on dupilumab in the registry. So we estimated that we had a coverage rate of about 40%. Hopefully it's better now, but we don't know for sure, but we are, uh, of course, investigating this again. Um, we can also see that the, the, the drug survival is uh, pretty good for the patients. 71% um, of all patients on systemic treatment are still on the treatment one year after they started, and about 62% are on the same treatment after two years. Dupilumab and methotrexate are the, the most prevalent uh, treatments to be registered in the, in the registry. Um, and we can also see um, that the outcome measures uh, tend to generally improve for, for the patients um, already after three months of treatment. Most uh, patients are improved and they stay improved for uh, quite a long time if the treatment does work, which it, do, it does for, for most. And just for reference, these are a few of the, the publications uh, so far based on, on, on data from uh, Swedad. And um, this is uh, something that's very engaging and fun to work with. Um, I think it has brought a new quality of care for these patients we can engage them uh, in a much better way than we, than we used to, I think. So um, I could talk about this all morning, but I won't because there are many other uh, interesting talks to come. So I would like to kind of conclude by saying thank you so much for your attention. And this is a, a picture of our uh, Sahlgrenska University Hospital in Gothenburg, Sweden on a particularly nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.